While the primordial waters seem to have pre-existed the formation of the universe, a seemingly infinite expanse of bottomless fluid, the first actual creation of day one in Genesis is that of light. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. But this could not be. Like the oxygen needed to bond with hydrogen to make water, light did not exist in the early universe. For just as molecules need the nuclear reaction of stars to create oxygen, light also requires stars. Some believers in the scientific accuracy of the scriptures nonetheless believe there is a correspondence between what Genesis reports and what science has discovered. Dr. David Neiman was a renowned scholar in the fields of biblical studies in Jewish history. He believed there was no conflict between Genesis and modern science, and indeed felt modern science merely confirmed the story of the biblical creation. The first thing that God created by word was, let there be light. I could picture that as the ball of light, what God created by saying, let energy enter, and the Big Bang proceeds from that. Because if we take modern cosmology, and you read Weinberg's book called The First Three Minutes. Weinberg wrote a beautiful book. He's a Nobel Prize winner in physics. He wrote a beautiful book, a short book called The First Three Minutes, in which he tries to describe the first three minutes of creation. And it goes like this. If the universe is larger today than it was yesterday, let's go back a million years, a billion years, two billion, and the galaxies are getting closer together because we're Sent, we're moving the, the, the movie backwards. So the galaxies are closer together, and at a certain point, the sky is no longer black or dark. It becomes light. And the temperature of the interstellar space, which is now measured, by the way, at 2.9 degrees above absolute zero. It's not absolute zero. It's nearly three degrees above absolute zero. It becomes warm. Then the sky becomes warm. It becomes hot. It becomes light, and the galaxies are rushing back to their origin, and soon the temperature rises to a million degrees. At a million degrees, not only do compounds break down, but atoms begin to break down. And at two million degrees, subatomic particles begin to fly apart, and when it gets down to the high degrees, 10 billion degrees, 20 billion degrees, the subatomic particles are already broken up, into the super subatomic particles, the smallest of which is called a photon. And a photon is simply a Greek word of saying a unit of light, which is the smallest of all. And if the whole universe was an infinitesimal or a small ball of photons or units of light, then according to the modern Big Bang Theory, how did the universe begin? With a ball of light? which began to expand and grow into the universe. That's why I say this statement, is, it moves me to wonder if the universe started by God saying, let there be light, and this conforms to the modern theory of cosmology, and this was written when, 1000 BC? Who knew that the universe started with a ball of light? Only the Creator. But the photons of visible light to which Dr. Neiman refers did not exist at the moment of the Big Bang. And visible light is what Genesis 1 says was created on the first day. The Hebrew word for light in Genesis 1 verses 3 through 5 is or. It is the same word used later in Genesis 1 for the light of the sun. Throughout scripture, or is used for visible light. And visible light is created by stars. Stars, however, did not come into existence until the universe was over 200 million years old.
Our universe is now 380,000 years old and trillions and trillions of miles across. Clouds of hydrogen and helium gas float through space. It will take another 200 million years before those gases create the first stars. The first stars ignited the universe into what must have been the most amazing fireworks. The universe went from the dark ages to an age of splendor when the first stars illuminated the gas and the universe began to glow in majestic fashion. I wish it had been there. It was like Christmas tree lights turning on. The universe began to light up in all directions until you form the beautiful mosaic we now see today. The first stars form when lumps of matter from the early universe grow to about 10 million times the mass of our sun, when the universe is about one thirtieth of its current size. The lumps of matter containing stars coalesce to form galaxies and clusters of galaxies. The first stars produce lots of ultraviolet radiation, which ionizes most of the neutral hydrogen, that is, liberating the electrons from the protons, thereby ending the so-called dark age of the universe. You need stars to create light. So again, Genesis got it wrong. There was no light as the first act of creation, only darkness. Darkness for over 200 million years. Is there a problem with the evening and morning markers used in Genesis, marking the beginning and ending of the days of creation, if there was no sun until day four? I don't think so. If we take seriously for a moment that an omniscient God exists, or at least those who wrote the story took seriously that an omniscient God existed, who created the universe just as Genesis claims, then this deity certainly planned in advance the creation of the earth and the sun and the passage of time as it would come to be conceived. In order to tell such time in human language, to make it known that the creation days prior to day four were equal in length as those that came after, why not simply use the formula evening and morning and designate them as days? We do the same thing for our astronaut friends as they spin around the planet in the International Space Station. Literal mornings and evenings, with the rising and the setting of the sun as viewed from Earth, do not occur for them in orbit. And yet, they have work days, mornings, evenings, nights, etc., that correspond to the common days, mornings, evenings, and nights that we experience while stuck to the planet. I see no reason why literal 24-hour days, with mornings and evenings, cannot be measured as such, even in the absence of a sun. Indeed, the creation story of Genesis has far bigger problems than merely the measurement of God's creation days.